Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Everyone is touched by psychiatric conditions, either themselves or a loved one. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Today on Healthy Minds. I can never summon up words or compare it to anything that I've experienced. To give you a sense, Kay Jamison was asked after her, just after her husband died, is the mourning of your husband, the grief of your husband dying, how does that compare to the depression? And she said they don't compare. Depression is just a whole other level. But then it went into a full psychosis, and that's when it's really clear. You go insane. And the insanity is not like people really think or understand. That's today on Healthy Minds. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. What is it like to live with bipolar disorder? Today I speak with filmmaker Paul Dalio, who shares his experiences with this condition. His personal journey inspired his first feature film, Touched with Fire. I saw myself involuntarily last night. Yes, you can't I know, keep but me you're here. Still not allowed no. To be no, 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 no. This is a hospital it's for sick people. I'm not sick. I can understand why you'd be here. You look very sick to me. There's no life in your face. Paul's experience and perspective offers an important message of hope for anyone with bipolar disorder. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an honor, it's a huge honor. I wanna start off by asking you what it was like when you made the film Touch With Fire. For you as a person who has bipolar disorder to present what it's like for people living with that condition. It was like sh healing a deeply shared wound with, with a lot of people who, who go through it. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because when, when you go through a trauma that's extremely deep, you're kind of forced to bring some kind of meaning and beauty to it to cope with it, you know, as a way of coping with it. And it starts as a self-healing thing, um, but then when you when you create the actual story itself you're you're going through the process of trying to understand and bring the beauty and understand you know going what you experienced and you really only could do it after you came out of it because really the process of the film is allowing the character to come out of it to hopefully inspire others to come out of it but uh, to, to actually, in terms of showing what it's like to be bipolar and to have it, it was tremendous because even films that I loved, um, I wanted to humanize these people and show them in a way that, that no one who doesn't have bipolar could understand. I, I felt like it was a huge duty as, because there's not any bipolar filmmakers that I know of. And, you know, you can only really convey something in its full depth if you have been in the skin of someone who has it. So my, my biggest joy is when people started telling me they're envious of people with bipolar, when they, when they kind of rode the manic highs and the gifts and the beauty of the, as well as the tragedies of this, there was a level of appreciation where they were no longer seeing these people through a clinical lens, but they were seeing them through a human lens. Through a broader perspective of pluses and minuses that any condition can result in for a person. Exactly. Um, and the unique thing about this particular condition that is a huge opportunity for people to see the beauty and the, and the stigma is that there is this huge correlation between uh, the artistic and the emotional uh, brilliance and, and creativity and, and beauty of these people that, that goes with the with the condition, which is why 38% of Pulitzer Prize winning poets were bipolar, and you know why uh, so, so why there's been studies on on its correlation, and so it's 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 and it's like in shaman cultures that the, they are the shaman, you know, the, the like they're not the sick ones, they're the ones who 
have experienced something which is a little bit outside of the realm of the normal psyche that people in the culture value. So it's not only just an opportunity to feel bad for these people or to even, um, you know, to pity them or to, but it's an opportunity for these people to feel like they're looked up to. And it's only when these people feel like they're looked up to and respected will it ever feel like the hell they went through is worth it and will, it ever, would I, will they ever have something to fuel the human spirit because the human spirit isn't satisfied with pity. I want to ask you to, to go back to when you first realized there might be issues that are different than people who don't have this condition. When did you first notice symptoms or issues in your life? Actually, the first thing I noticed that was different, to be honest, was um, when I was in college, I was at the dramatic writing program, the screenwriting program. And you know, college is when you experiment and you're staying up late and you're drinking and doing all kinds of stuff. And in, with writing, you're experimenting with everything with writing, and marijuana was one of them. And I noticed that for some reason, while, while other people, when they smoke marijuana, they like uh, eat Ben and Jerry's and watch cartoons, you know, and be completely out of it, for some reason it sped up my mind. And uh, that was a misleading thing because I didn't realize where that was headed, but that was one of the things that took me towards hypomania. And a hypomanic state is a state where your mind is moving a lot faster than most minds, and then it's firing out connections between things more than most minds. And so temporarily, there's great writing that comes out of it and great insight, but then it reaches a level act of activity uh, of the brain that it can't sustain that level of activity. And the level of cognition is too great for the physiology to support it. And so it burns out your brain and exhausts the chemicals. And then I went into a temporary funk depression. And I hadn't gone into the full psychosis until uh, after that. Shortly after that, I was coming out. And then I was even higher and uh, greater than I was before. But then it went into a full psychosis. And that's when it's really clear. You go insane. and. The insanity is not like people really think or understand where you just are experiencing full delusion. What happens is that uh, you see, uh, and actually there was a, this is what I experienced, and also a brain uh, psych uh, a scientist on creativity in the brain confirmed it. But what you, what you do is every kind of man-made object around you which has uh, a simple meaning to it that's ascribed by contemporary culture, kind of vanishes and in their place comes flooding layers and layers of timeless mythic meanings that would reoccur across cultures and mythologies. And so an egg w wouldn't just be an egg that you eat. It would be the origin of existence, you know, and the yolk would be the sun from where all life began. So it would have multiple layers of meanings, including the one that we have. Uh, but what happens is your mind is starts uh, your eyes start darting from one of these images to the next, interweaving their meanings, and suddenly you start spiraling into this mythic story uh, in which you're, um, you're falling into what is symbolically deep and insightful and profound, but you take it literally, and that's why you go insane. You know, you think you're in the apocalypse. You think you're, even though the apocalypse is a metaphor for something bigger. So that's when it was clear. And, and when you experienced those symptoms, what happened? What, 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 what happened to you? So I was in, uh, I, I went out to get uh, a job with a producer out in LA. Uh, and uh, I was just kind of getting out of the funk, you know, of, uh, and I was kind of desperate to get a job. So I started writing all these scripts and submitting when I finally got it, when I went out there, I remember I was sitting in the hotel and I was, I was celebrating and I was in the middle, I was like halfway through this joint inhale because I kind of went back off of, uh, back into the sort of creative state that, was that I knew was dangerous and that's when it kind of struck me like a bolt of lightning to my brain and I did go into seeing those symbols and they did take the form of the apocalypse and it did escalate where I was running through the streets, thinking I was seeing signs and symbols being laid, and then that eventually s spiraled into me thinking that the producer that, that brought me out there to get the job was staging a fictional apocalypse through the media, 
you know, and that he wanted to cause it in the media to sort of scare people back to good and create that, you know, life rebirth. Then, but that, I, that spiraled into me thinking that he brought me out there because I was the Antichrist, and he thought I was the one who was going to execute it. And then that spiraled into that he really did want to cause the apocalypse. And eventually, in, a, in terror and panic, I went to, I was in the lobby of the hotel, and in the lobby of the hotel, they happen to have this glass case where the, they put these women to just hang out there. And on one level, it represented like the decadence of Hollywood that like, felt like it had to be killed off. But in a flash in my mind, I saw a bottle of like two glasses, um, and I saw an image of that I was going to be put in there, and I was going to be forced to sleep with this woman who was supposed to be the angel of the apocalypse, and she would give birth to the Christ figure that would be born, reborn from my womb, and they would kill, kill me and drink my blood to toast to the rebirth that would occur, um, So, which is basically just a culmination of all these myths, which were, and then, and then I threw um, this steel case at the, there was no one in there, but I threw a steel case at the glass case, and that's when I got arrested. Okay, so that's what I was gonna ask you, because you're having all of these really intense thoughts it made you frightened? Yeah, you're in a panic at some point. When you think you're gonna be sacrificed, naturally you, go and you become panicked, and so. So somebody looking from the outside wouldn't understand why is this person throwing something? Yeah. Whereas internally to you, you have good reason to be doing so given all of these thoughts that you're experiencing. Yeah, and that's a big problem with society because I was brought to a place for the criminally insane, which is one of the Ten worst prisons in the U.S. rated with severe abuse, and and these are supposed to be totally criminally insane, brutal people. I was charged with assault when I didn't throw it at anybody, and so I was supposed to have my court date six months from when I entered. And when I went in there, these are some of the most sensitive people that I've ever met, and there was it was beautiful exchanges we had. I mean, they were just cracked, they were broken, but but they were not like we think they are. And so and I think to myself that I was in a panic and terror of what I was experiencing and they interpret it as assault. I think to myself how many of the people in there are being abused for years and years because they were just misunderstood. Right, people may be having certain experiences that result in behaviors, but it's not out of evil intent. That's it's right. because they're having symptoms of whatever condition they may be experiencing. That's right. You spoke about being in a funk prior to that. Tell me a little bit more about that, about the depressed kind of feelings. Yeah, the depressed is, I can never summon up words that match the level of hell or compare it to anything that I've experienced before that when I was sane that would match the level of hell. To give you a sense, Kay Jamison was asked after her, just after her husband died, is the mourning of your husband, the grief of your husband dying, how does that compare to the depression? And she said they don't compare. Depression is just a whole other level. That it's so overwhelming above and beyond anything else going on yeah. in your life. Yeah, you're, that, there's a reason why people want to commit suicide, and the reason is because people can't fathom that. but. It's the only option you see to get out of that hell. And anything that exists in what happens after that suicide, be it imagining you go on to another life or imagining your existence just completely stops, is a relief. To avoid that pain to that the person it. feels at that moment. Yeah, and it's even beyond pain. You don't even experience pain, you miss pain. Like pain in what we consider to be pain, which is where you actually get to have an emotional experience of it's, it's worse than pain. It's like, it's hell, meaning it's like there's, everything just vanishes and you're just in this abyss, this dark black and blue abyss, you know. And how did you cope with that when you were experience, experiencing it? Um, the best thing I did was I, get a job, I got a job in construction because it was a way of getting my mind off the suicidal thoughts. You know, because you, you just lie in bed. You, what you do at first is you try to sleep. That's your way of coping. 
you try to just escape your reality and your existence. And you try to, uh, but then what happens is when you're in the midst of that sleep, you wake up and all of a sudden the truth sinks in of, oh my God, I'm still alive in this life. And then the little energy that your mind has is spent fighting the idea of suicide. And those thoughts fester as you're lying there, it's just all the fantasies of how to do it and trying to convince yourself not to do it, but then the, the other voice convincing yourself to do it. So getting a job in construction was a way of just kind of going and doing something physical that's out in the world and just focusing on the task. And you know, just kind of, you know, whether you're sawing something or doing something, you're just, by having your mind focused on that task, it pulls you out of the thoughts, the suicidal thoughts, that helped enormously. So really going to work, exercise, physical activity. You can't exercise with, you, you don't have you the brain chemistry to exercise. Like it's the, hard for people. You don't have the strength to really go and exercise. Yeah, it's, it's hard for people to fathom this. Almost a, a catch 22. If it you did good. go for a run, it could help you, but it's hard to get to do that. What have you done to be able to move forward with your life, maintain your health, with the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, but move forward with your life. What, what, how do you do that? The first thing was hope. That was the first thing, that there'd actually be any hope of getting somewhere that wasn't just getting by, that, that I could thrive. And that was through meeting Kay Jamison. When, when she told me that she doesn't know any artist who's not more creative after bipolar than before bipolar, as long as they're on the meds, that was basically telling me you could be more creative than you were before all this happened. You could be better than you were before all this happened. And that hope allowed me to fight for it. And when I fought for it, the next thing was severe determination. Um, and what I mean is like, you're always looking around every corner for another health habit to, to incorporate, you know, and you just keep collecting them and anything it takes to do, you know, anything like running cold showers sleep nine to five meditate transcendental meditations light box um you just pick up so many and the, the and the the thing is the key is uh to to just be so focused on and the the benefit of this is that the the brain, the bipolar brain, is a hypersensitive brain where things that bring other people down bring you much lower. Like if you have too many drinks or you know, if you stay up late, you know, if you do eat too much sugar, you'll go way lower than most people. But things that bring other people up can bring you much higher than a lot of other people because there's just a, such a sensitivity of the brain. So if you start living by healthy habits, you feel invincible, like you could do anything and your life starts changing, you know? You, and that's when I was able to be creative again. I was able to start a family. I was able to, to do these things. And now I feel that it's a gift just because I never would have forced myself into that state had I not had no choice. You know, had the options been you could be in the hell you were or you could be much higher than you were, but you, you have to, you know, because it's a lifelong tightrope. It never stops. You're just always trying to stay vigilant. You always slip, but you just get better at catching yourself. Are there early warning signs that you are aware of in yourself that maybe I'm starting to become a little bit depressed or starting to become a little bit manic? And what are those signs and what do you do when you experience them? Yeah, they, they it's tricky because they, they definitely will always come. Uh, you just gain more experience at managing it. The first times it would happen, it would be difficult to even want to acknowledge that there was, particularly with the hypomania, if the spring came and I'm feeling great and my energy's going up, and I'm feeling happy, I want to go out and have a good time, I wouldn't want to say, you know what, you have to go indoors and shut the lights and not go out this afternoon and this, you know, and you might have to raise the meds for a couple weeks where you're gonna feel a little bit numb until the hypomania comes down and then you can raise it. You would never want to acknowledge you had it. And so at first I, I didn't and I would then rely on my wife who knows me so well and so like counting on loved ones who can 
really be there to, to, to see it and, and then trusting them. And, and then, you, then you will eventually start to know it. You start to feel the difference between being happy and up and being a little hypomanic. So the hypomanic for the person you've experienced it can actually be very pleasant and upbeat. You like it. It leads in a direction that if it spirals, gets out of control. So it's really being able to step back and say, this may seem good now, but I know what's going to happen. In some ways, having experienced that allows you to step back from it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's almost like the depression is the opposite side of the coin, where you have to evaluate, OK, what, what's happening that's making me starting to feel bad? Because, and how do you catch yourself early? Like, so it could be, for instance, I'll catch myself eating junk food and not like to boost my brain chemistry and like not exercising and suddenly like my energy will slip down and suddenly I won't be as vital with my kids and I won't know why that happened. And I'll realize looking but tracing my steps, it was cloudy this morning, this particular morning, and I didn't do the light box. And so it was like a, a slipping effect of one thing unravels to the next. So then you don't do the light box, your brain chemistry is a little lower. So then you eat some junk food. So then you don't work as well with the same clarity. And, and that can unfold lower and lower and lower if, you don't, if you're not able to nip it at the bud. And, but the thing is, um, the more you go through life, the more you can see it early and you can manage it. You know, so you know exactly what to do. It sounds like you have a, a very good sensitivity to yourself, and you also rely on others such as your wife. What's it like for your wife? How does, how does she help you, and what, what's it like for her? The fortunate thing is she's actually a little bit attracted to craziness. So <laughs> when we, and when we met at film school, uh, I was not in my worst shape. You know, I was, I was like in a low place, but it was more like numbness from the meds. I wasn't dysfunctional. I was like able to get by, but I was very antisocial. And I remember the first time we met, uh, we were at film school in the first like week, and everyone's socializing, and she's like social center, just talking to everybody, joking around. And I come in the room with like a black hood on, like blasting rap music, like totally alone, not even taking the headphones out, and just sit down in front of her. And like no one was talking to me, but she reached forward and like pulled the the hood off of my head, and like smiled, and that would really be a metaphor for what she would do in my life. She knows you well enough, and you trust her well enough to that. If she's saying you're moving in this direction or that direction, you know that she's right, and take the steps, whether it be the light box or some other steps, to help you with that. That's right, and she saved me multiple times because of that. So she'd say it. And she say it early, and I, I would say, okay, you know, I do whatever I had to do. One of the things that sometimes blocks people from treatment, from getting help, is concern about losing that creativity. Well, I'm more creative now than I was before, but it took a lot of patience and it took a lot of work, and it was really the hope that I know it could happen because of what Kay Jamison told me that I was able to fight for it. I wouldn't have fought for it if I didn't think there was any chance. And Kay Jamison, for people who don't know of her, is a psychologist, a researcher, a clinician who also has bipolar disorder. Your creativity is enhanced by the experiences that you've had, but maintaining a level of control over it so that it doesn't get out of control and become a manic episode, but taking advantage of some of the experiences that you've had in the hypomanic state yes. without getting there, but making use of that experience, yes. creativity, That's creatively. That's the perfect uh, metaphor because it's your way to never lose the magic of the mania. It's your way to preserve it, encapsulate it in a way that can be sustained in a way that other people can experience it through you and through whatever you create so you don't miss the mania. Well, you, Paul, are very inspiring and I want to thank you for sharing your experiences both in terms of what you've gone through and creatively to really reach people in a way that's very meaningful. So 
thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. I'm inspired by Paul's message of hope, how he's able to live a full, productive, and happy life with bipolar disorder, and how with treatment and the support of his family, he's able to thrive and feels even more creative than before the onset of his illness. Paul's experience shows that with help, there is hope. Until next time, I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Goodbye. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. If you would like to watch our expert interview in its entirety, log on to bbrfoundation.org slash healthyminds.